So, over the next couple of weeks, uh, you will get exposed to microcontrollers. Okay. Uh, so, today we will discuss uh, not specifically the experiment you are going to do tomorrow, for which you will be given uh, a write up, a manual, etcetera, and it is not difficult to just follow it and during the class. But for you to understand uh, overall what these microcontrollers are, what you can do with them. Uh, what sort of resources they offer, what it means to program them, how does it play a role in the context of uh, the course that we are doing, experimentation and measurement. I mean, so, those sort of things we will discuss today. Okay? Uh, so, I will not say that you have to do click here, click, click there, click there, click here and then you will be able to perform the experiment tomorrow. That is not what I, I will do, but we will have more sort of generic discussion. Uh, with some question and answers for you to get a feel for what these things are and what, what microcontrollers are. How many of you have heard of this uh, word microcontrollers before? Everybody has heard of it. How many of you know what, what they are? Raise your hand like full 180 degrees, no elbow bend. Char punch low. How many of you have some vague idea? vague idea of what what this stuff is okay some 20 30 40 okay that's expected so we'll get started uh, started now so those of you who attended the last lecture i think there is going to be a fair inter, fair big intersection between those who are sitting here today and those who attended the last lecture what we are doing uh, as part of learning something about experimentation measurement is processing data from sensors. That is what we have been trying to do over the last uh, three or four weeks. Okay. So, what, what do we mean by processing data from sensors? Uh, it can include things like analog to digital conversion, digital to analog conversion uh, sort of processes. Uh, something other than that, that we, we will learn today okay. uh, and the reason why we should be able to do that etc also we will discuss okay so the context of today's discussion is still remains the same which is processing data from installed sensors we are not yet touching upon other important issues pertaining to experimentation and measurement okay so we had a discussion about engines and, and sensors etc uh, present in engines last time okay so just briefly rejogging your memory from last lecture, uh, data from sensors comes in various forms okay, and you have been exposed to some of those forms. Data can be in the form of analog signals or it can be in the form of digital signals. The data that is presented to you may, be, may vary in continuous time or in discrete time etcetera. So, you need to be familiar with these ideas analog versus digital, continuous time versus discrete time etcetera for you to be able to comfortably involve yourself in a measurement exercise. So, that, that was the purpose of the last couple of labs. Okay, so, comfort level with various forms essential. The other thing you, you need to be able to do from a skill, skill set perspective, not, not so much conceptually, uh, is that you need to be able to deal with these beasts called microcontrollers. Okay, and we will see why you need, why you need them because they are very useful resources. So, if you know how to deal with them, uh, it will be useful for you. Okay. So, I am going to give a parallel. So, it is like, uh, it is like any other tool. So, for example, if you are a carpenter, okay, what sort of tools you need to be comfortable with? And saw, what else? Hammer, chisel that sort of thing right. Similarly, if you are a experimentalist today, you need to be comfortable with microcontrollers. So, it is like a tool that you use to capture data, okay? nothing more than that. So, for you, you need to be able, if you do not ever see a chisel or a hammer or a saw and somebody just threw it at you, you probably do not know what to do with it. Okay? Even if you have seen it, you probably do not know what to do with it, but more so if you have not seen it. So, we are going to get familiar with things like microcontrollers. 
uh, mainly in the lab, but today we'll start discussing it. Okay. So the next couple of weeks, we'll uh, famil we'll familiarize or give you an option uh, opportunity to familiarize yourself with these uh, these devices, and then. Uh, Three or four weeks uh, subsequent to that, you will be doing measurement of different physical quantities while utilizing all the stuff that you have learned about data processing and electronics. Okay, so that's what we will we will end up doing in this course. So, what are microcontrollers? Uh, so, a microcontroller is a general purpose brain. So, we'll which can be programmed. That's like the definition of a human being, also, right? Some general purpose brain into which some stuff can be put and the human being will react in some way. This is very similar except that the programmer is not God or nature as you <coughs> as the case with us the programmer is a human being. So human beings have constructed these brains and human beings program them other human beings program them. Okay. So a typical microcontroller looks like this looks like an electronic device okay this is the famous microcontroller the pic microcontroller lot of pins coming out black stuff and lot of pins coming out okay it's an integrated circuit with lot of computational ability or lot of computational opportunity given for people who want to utilize it okay so in terms of how it is going to look it's going to look something like this not necessarily the exact replica you are going to be using something else uh, not this microcontroller, but it's basically going to look like lot of pins coming out of a black dabba. Okay, that's that's how a microcontroller is, is going to look like. Now let's have a discussion. So this will this is where I will spend most of my time, maybe 10-15 minutes. Uh, what features you think? So first of all, it is important to appreciate that a general purpose brain is useful. Okay, so what do we mean by that? Suppose I had to, suppose I had, I was God, okay, and I had to design a human being. Hmm, the sort of, sort of structure of the brain that I need to put together, such that the brain will be able to absorb and operate in an environment that you usually see, right? So that that goes in, that is what goes into the design of a brain. Okay, similarly, so the brain will have certain features. The brain will have capabilities to do certain things and will not have capabilities to do something else. So let's have a discussion on what sort of features a programmable brain should ideally have. Okay. What should it be able to do? So I'm going to ask four or five of you to blabber whatever comes to your mind. So take some input from the environment. What else? Memory. That's very good. So one second, so someone said it has to deal with the external environment, someone else has uh, said it has to have memory, what else? After taking the input it should provide the desired output and it should have some speed Okay. as fast as possible. It should be some fast or something. Yes. So Joe, don't just throw words there, suppose you had to design a human brain, what capabilities would you want in the human brain? Analyze the input. Uh, yes. Analyze the input. Yes. It's a fairly straightforward question. It's not difficult. Just say whatever comes to your mind. Should be able to differentiate the inputs. Differentiate what? Whatever inputs are there, it should be able to differentiate. Okay. Pink, pink shirt there. You. Is it pink or what? It should have a program uh, to follow a particular algorithm if it's given an input. You have thrown some words. Have a program to follow a particular algorithm if given an input. What other words will you throw? Output? Yeah, that's that's a programmable, that's the program part of it, right? I'm asking for, just look at your brain. What What sort of ability does it have? Someone talked about memory. Someone else talked about ability to take some signals and give some signals out. What other ability does it have? Keep track of time. That's that's very important. Do you think your brain keeps track of time? 
How many of you say your, your brain keeps track, track of time? Others don't think it keeps track of time. So I took this off now and I keep blabbering something here. You will sit here for eternity. I will just say 527. You will sit here for eternity. You do keep track of time, but not the sort of time that a clock keep tracks of, uh, clock keeps track of. Okay. What else, what else is your brain able to do? That's a very good point. Brain is able to prioritize a lot of things that keep coming to you. But you decide what you want to do. Or your brain decides to accept certain things, reject certain things. Okay, so ability to prioritize. What else? Perform functions on its own. Okay. Any other basic functionality? Multitasking. Just say whatever you want. I mean, it's, it's fine. We are just having a discussion. Multitasking. Multitasking. Okay. What do you, okay, that's an important point. Let's, let's have a discussion on that. What do you mean by multitasking? Someone wants to say something. Huh? What do you mean by multitasking? Uh, basically, it's like doing multiple tasks at a single time, but it's uh, not a it's not simultaneous, it's slotting the time into slots and... Uh, so, you're, you're dividing the time, you're apportioning the time into... The you'll do this task, then you'll do this task, then again you'll come back and do this task, again you'll come back and do that task, etc. Right? That's another thing that our brains are able to do. Okay, so suppose I'm teaching here, and then I get a phone call. Hmm? Now my brain recognizes that there is a phone call because my ears tell, tell the brain that there is some sound coming and the brain interprets it as, as a phone call. Now I can decide to take the phone call, talk to the person, put it back and then come back to you and start, start lecturing again. Or I can decide that I won't take the phone call now okay, and continue lecturing. So the point is that I am able to interrupt my scheme of working, process something and then come back to it, whatever I was doing. Okay? That is also a useful feature to have if you want to deal with the real world. So we are, we are talking about the abilities that you need to deal with the real world. So if you are a saint going and sitting in Rishikesh somewhere, you don't need all this. You don't need this ability at all. You can just like chill, let the world do whatever it wants to do. Right? We are talking about ability to deal with the real world. So you need memory. Hmm? So we will list, list some of them. This is not exhaustive, but we will list some of them. All the answers are, are already out there. One is that you need the ability to compute. If you, are, if you want a programmable brain, you should be able to, somebody said analyze, has something to do with computation. But uh, ability to compute, you should be able to add, subtract, multiply, divide, whatever. You need to be able to execute logic. If I tell you do this, if this happens and not if this happens, you should be able to execute that logic. Otherwise, dealing with the real world becomes difficult. Right? What else? You should, someone already pointed this out. Ability to receive and generate signals. Ability to keep time. Okay, should know knowledge of time. Ability to respond to interrupts. If you are not able to respond to inter by interrupts, I mean by interruptions to what you are doing, then you will not be able to multitask. Will you be able to multitask if you are not able to respond to interrupts? You cannot because e even if you know no uh, seemingly external thing is keeping you uh, from or, or seemingly external thing is asking you to multitask. You yourself have to know that I am going to apportion this much time for this thing, then I will come back to something else, I am going to apportion that much time to that thing, then I will come back to something else. Only then will you be able to multitask. Otherwise, you will just be executing the same, same thing. Okay? So, these are the abilities that are usually available in microcontrollers. Nothing, nothing more. Okay? 
So what you need to be able to do, you are going to be a user of a microcontroller. You are not, you're not going to design microcontrollers. You do not need to know the details of the internal circuitry. Okay, but you need to know how to utilize them to deal with the real world. Okay, that is the context in which we are having a discussion today. Okay, so uh, many of you will, so there are a lot of unknowns that, that will be thrown at you because, because of uh, things to do with the construction of the microcontroller, things to do with abilities being described in a certain way that you need to be comfortable with, need to get used to. But what, what I am asking of you is the maturity to realize that what you need to be able to do is to utilize a certain set of subset of the resources provided by a microcontroller to your advantage. Okay. So the last statement I made is, is a critical statement. Most people get overwhelmed by information that is provided when you have to deal with a microcontroller. Okay. The trick is an, is an actually understanding the overall sense of what a microcontroller is and utilize only those resources that are required. And, and know that if you want to utilize some other resources, you can always do it. You can always learn it. Okay. The idea is not to be exhaustive. So please keep that in mind. Okay. You don't sit with a microcontroller data sheet and go pages after pages, um, thousand pages and say, oh, I know this microcontroller fully. It is a, it's of no value. Okay. What is of value is to real, realize that there are some resources provided. Those resources provided are common usually across microcontrollers and the utilization or the usage of the resources also remain the same. The way to utilize the resources largely remain the same. If you have this sort of a background, then you will you'll be, you'll find it comfortable for you to deal with different microcontrollers even if you have not experienced them yourself. Okay? Clear? Any, any questions about about this discussion because this is a central discussion. If you get, if you have a, a reasonable appreciation of what we discussed, then there is a lot of detail which we cannot teach. It's something that you need to experience and learn. Okay, but at the same time, you need to be aware of what detail is important, what detail is not important for the sort of things that you are doing. Okay, so we'll uh, we'll come to some of these. Uh, so I'm now what I'm going to do is try and get you familiar with some terminology okay, and marry it with what we just discussed. Some terminology which you are going to repeatedly encounter that you need to get familiar with. Okay. So I am just going to throw this picture here. So this is a typical set of resources provided by a modern day microcontroller. Okay. There are lots of words thrown there or, or lots of symbols etc. We will discuss a few of them You and they are not difficult to understand from a conceptual angle. On the left side you see a, you see an oval. That part, so you see a, something called flash, I mean you can, can you see that? The, the red thing on the left, it says flash. So this is that part of the microcontroller, you just think of a microcontroller as having a whole bag of resources. This is that part of the microcontroller which will accept programs. Okay. So you can decide what the resources in the microcontroller need to execute or how, how they have to work with each other and the outside world. And that program or that set of instructions resides in something called flash. I mean, why it is called flash, etc., is, is, is something else. It has to do with the technology of how that uh, VLSI element is built. Uh, but as far as you are concerned, the flash is where the program resides. Okay? I am just giving you some terminology. You must have also heard of the term RAM. Okay? You probably also know the full form. What is the full form? Random access memory. Hmm? What is random access memory? Yellow shirt, you tell me. Uh, the part of memory which are used to uh, compute any signal you, it receives. As compute? in the temporary whatever. First of all, it is memory. So it has to remember. It should, it's not computing anything. Yeah, but it's the 
it's not the exact memory, it's a temporary memory which it stores on compute. Think. Okay, anybody else willing to take a, take a shot at it? Okay, so th this is one kind of memory, uh, tends to be volatile in the sense that it's used primarily during runtime. When the microcontroller is powered on, you want to store some information, some variables, some values, etc., in some location for immediate retrieval. Okay? It's like when you are when you are trying to do something, suppose you are you have some two, three numbers that you have to add, subtract, etc. In the middle, suppose you have to say take a number, multiply it by 5 and then plus 3 divided by 4, whatever it is. All the intermediate answers you need to keep track of for you to get the final answer. Okay? It does not matter after you get the final answer what these intermediate numbers were, if you are executing the process properly. So, uh, some memory elements are provided okay, in a typical microcontroller for you to be able to do this. Okay, so, I am not being very precise here, but I am just trying to explain in layman's language. Okay, so, that part of the microcontroller which allows you sort of runtime memory is RAM. Okay? It, it does not compute anything. It only stores information which you uh, which some other part of the microcontroller can retrieve or put into. At the bottom most you see something called a CPU. Okay? The CPU usually has two components. One is a one is what is called an ALU, arithmetic and logic unit. Okay. That is the one that computes 8 plus 3. Those sort of circuitry which, which do computation. All of you are, uh, are doing a course in uh, basic electrical engineering, right? So, did you do any half adder, full adder circuitry and all that? Huh? Not yet. Okay, anyway. So, the CPU contains information on uh, or sorry not contains information has ability to compute. It also has ability to store information as well as ability to uh, process information, but the main part of it one of the main parts of it is the ALU. Another main part of it is the timing and control circuitry. That circuitry is the one which orchestrates the functioning of different things. It is like a manager. Okay? Man suppose there are, I am a manager and I know that for, there are four or five people, one person can compute very well, one person can do something else very well. So, I am the timing and control guy who will say, okay, you compute now, give me the result, you take this result and you do this thing, give me that, give me the answer or, or you put it outside into the real world, take something else from somewhere, give it to me. So, I am, I am like the manager, I do not really do anything. I just keep telling other people what to do. Okay? So, that part of it is there in the CPU. Aside from this, there are some words thrown there which you may be familiar with. One word definitely you should be familiar with. What is it? One word right in the middle of everything that you should be familiar with by now. Timer you are familiar with already in the context of this course, you may be familiar with it from before. Starts with A, oh, that ATD, hmm. okay. that is analog to digital converter, that is also sitting inside the microcontroller. Okay. Modern day microcontrollers have a lot of features already inside them, you just have to utilize them properly. Okay, so, you do not have analog to digital converter chips separately, all of that has been integrated into that package. What else? Anything else? Other things seem to be some, some jargon thrown around. Some of it you will get familiar, familiar with. Okay. So, the purpose of this slide is to tell you that you need to get somewhat familiar with these terms and uh, get familiar with the sort of resources. So, a typical microcontroller can talk to the external world if programmed correctly, can perform analog to digital conversion. After you get a digital number with a representation of the real world signal, you can process that digital number in your, in your CPU, pro produce another digital number which can be converted through a D to A 
all of that can be done inside the microcontroller okay that's all you need to at this time uh, be familiar with okay so so much about the resources i'm not going to go into each resource and say that you can do this you can do that you can do this you can do that one of the resources that you will utilize tomorrow uh, is the timer resource okay and i'll have a brief discussion on on the timer resource by pointing to a data sheet of a microcontroller okay because you need to get familiar with reading data sheets also so we will do that online now okay so little bit about programming these microcontrollers so remember a microcontroller is a general purpose brain which can be programmed the typical sort of resources or the abilities that you need also we have discussed need to keep time need to have memory need to be able to compute need to be able to process interrupts etc okay so you need to be able to program for it for you to exploit these resources that's what you are doing in microcontroller programming you are asking you are creating a set of instructions which the resources which exploit the resources provided by a microcontroller for example if you can keep time suppose you are a clock you keep counting 1 2 3 that's that's all you can do right and i want to program to find out what the time is you know, i can poll you i can say okay what is what is the time and you will tell me the time okay so programming is basically utilization of resources of the microcontroller since the microcontroller can do the typical sort of programming operations that you have been exposed to data operations conditional branching loops etc that forms part of microcontroller programming for sure the other thing that you need to get used to which you probably have not done in a cs101 sort of course is uh, to deal with resources with io resources io means input output stands for input output io resources which will deal with the real world that's the only significant addition on top of what whatever programming you, you already are exposed to so it's it's not very complicated and uh, we'll look at so for tomorrow's lab uh, what you will end up doing are three things two things mainly and one one extra you will generate a 1 millisecond clock utilizing the timer module so we'll discuss the timer module shortly not not specifically the microcontroller you will use but i will tell you what the timer module is what it can do what you are supposed to do to generate a 1 millisecond clock you will also generate a 1 second clock this is a bonus problem 1 millisecond clock means something has to go high and low every 1 millisecond okay then you will have to generate a 1 second clock something has to go low and high every 1 second both seem to be the same thing but they are not you will you will have to do you will have to get exposed to some minor tweaks but that's a bonus 1 millisecond clock everybody has to do 1 second clock is bonus and you will also make some leds blink okay you will put signals out such that some leds will blink this is all you will end up doing tomorrow okay but in the process it is an opportunity for you to learn how to use one resource or one or two resources of the microcontroller okay the idea is not the resource itself the idea is for you to be able to look at a data sheet and say that in order for me to use this resource i need to look at the data sheet in this way okay that is what the learning experience is it's not about making an led blink so you don't have to be proud about that okay but you can be proud about reading a data sheet and and figuring out what needs to be done for a given situation okay so this this is what you will do do in tomorrow's lab now i will get back a little bit to to the timer module okay i will show you how a data sheet looks like what you are supposed to do when you look at a data sheet sort of you know big picture advice any questions so far fairly straight forward stuff the one one thing is that there is really nothing conceptual you are going to learn it's a skill okay lots of pieces of information so if you're a good microcontroller programmer you end up having to learn a lot lots of different pieces of information but conceptually it, you can't say much you just know it and you're, you're utilizing that information okay so i'm going to open up a data sheet 
of a widely used microcontroller, but certainly not of the type that you will see tomorrow. Okay, the purpose, the reason why I am using a data sheet of a different microcontroller is for you to realize that there are different families, different manufacturers of microcontrollers. Okay. It does not matter as long as you have the general sense for what microcontrollers do, it does not matter much what set or what family you are dealing with. Tomorrow you are going to deal with a ubiquitous microcontroller. Any guesses on what, what it is, those who are already familiar with? Hmm? Yeah, you will see a ubiquitous microcontroller. I will ask you a question. I will, when I come tomorrow to the lab, first thing I will want to find out is, do you know what microcontroller you are utilizing? So, that is the first question you have to be able to answer. So, today we will, uh, so a typical manual looks like this. Okay, whole bunch of information that is provided to you which will, which will overwhelm you. Usually the first set of uh, pieces of information that is provided is what is called a pin description. So, we will, we will go to that. Okay, so what this pin description tells you, I uh, will show you the, show you the figure soon. It will tell you, if you are given a microcontroller, lots of, so the, a black box with lots of pins coming out what each of those pins are, that is all it is telling you. Okay. That you need to be familiar with. You do not need to know exactly what, what pin is doing what, but let me just show you the picture, so that you are comfortable with it. Okay. So, this, this sort of description is a pin description. Okay. Lots of pieces of information, mm, you are going to get completely psyched out, run away. So, your microcontroller is not going to be so involved, so you do not have to worry about it. I will show you the sort of pin description you will have to deal with, but I want to give you a sense for the pin description that is there in a more useful microcontroller than what you will be dealing with tomorrow. So, the first thing, just you can note these things down. First thing you will need to be reasonably familiar with is pin description. The second thing you will need to be familiar with is the overall uh, set of resources that are provided. So, I will mention those or I will show you the picture that you need to be familiar with. Okay. So, this sort of a picture. This tells you a whole bunch of resources that are ma made available to you. Okay. We have just discussed some of them. On the left top, that you see is, is the amount of program information the, the microcontroller can carry. How, what size of program can you put inside the microcontroller is given 128K, you know, 64K pertaining to RAM, you know, 128K to 1 megabytes of flash. Okay, this is the size of the program. Then what you see uh, on your right hand side are analog to digital converter information. Okay, on your right hand side top, okay. what sort of, how many analog to digital channels are available, okay. what is the bit resolution for the channels, usually uh, frequency of, uh, of sampling is also given. right? So, this is like a broad big picture description of the sort of resources that are provided. Okay. The bottom left, what is that part of it? Any guesses on what the bottom left part is, based on whatever we have discussed so far? Some address, some data, something else there, ADR, ADDR. Okay. So, anyway, we, we will come to some of these a little later. Okay. So, the second thing you need to be aware of is the sort of uh, resources that are available in the microcontroller. We will look at one such resource, okay, which is called the, the timer module. So, let me just go back here. So, if you look at the timer module, uh, what its purpose is, is, is it allows you to time your engagement with the outside world. So, what sort of things do you want to do? At this time, accept this input. At this time, give out this input. This is all the timer module is, is doing. Okay, its ability, you can program it to accept some input from the external world at a prescribed time and you can program it to put something out at another prescribed time. 
or you can program it to do something at a certain time that, that you prescribe. So the program will say what needs to be done, whether you accept inputs or you give, give outputs at what times. That is what the program needs to say. How to say it, we will we'll take a brief look at it, but basically the timer module allows you to do this. So what should the timer module have? What should the timer module internally contain for you to be able to do, uh, accept something at a certain time, give something out at a certain time? It should have a link to the clock for sure. What else should it be able to do? No idea. I mean, for how many people is this completely going like crazy? Kya kuch bhi bol hai? Raise your hands. 10, 15 people. Okay. So we are di discussing one particular resource of a microcontroller called the timer module. Okay. We said that a microcontroller need to be needs to be able to keep time. Okay. And do something with keeping time. The timer module allows you to work with the external world in accepting inputs and giving outputs. So we are discussing if I am, I am the timer module and I can accept inputs at a prescribed time, somebody can tell me you accept input at this time, give this out at this time, what should I be able to do? Suppose I tell you, okay, at 6 o'clock run away from this class, what should you be able to do? To in order to execute my instruction. You should set an alarm on your mobile phone. What should you be able to do? This, it's not so difficult for you to tell me what you should be able to do. Okay, what else? Suppose I don't have to remember it. You keep shouting, shouting to me. Leave at 6, leave at 6, leave at 6. Read the clock. Okay. This is, this is fairly straightforward question. I don't know what, what the difficulty is. Maybe it's too straightforward to answer. I'm asking this question. What should you be able to do if I tell you to execute the, the instruction that leave from here at 6 o'clock? Okay. So, the first thing is that you should be able to read the clock. So, you should have information about time. Okay. Second, you should be able to count. Suppose I, I tell you after 120, 120 counts of this clock you run away, you should be able to count. And the third, this you should be able to run away. You should be actually able to put some signal out or accept some signal. Okay? So the ability to actually do it. These are the only three things that are required. Fourth, you should be able to compare. Of course, if I keep counting, that's not enough. I should be able to compare with at what time I need to do what also. Okay? So the timer module has only these things. It has access to a clock. It has access to a counter which counts, it has access to a comparator which will find out if the counter has reached a certain value, it has to access to some IO devices. Okay? So in order to utilize a timer module, you will have to say what things, you will have to say what the clock speed is going to be, are you counting every one second or are you counting every one microsecond, etc. You have to say what the clock speed is going to be. You will have to say how many counts do you need to count for that clock speed before something happens. When that time happens, what do you need to do? Do you need to accept a signal or do you need to give out a signal? Okay. These are the only, only three major things that you will need to set. Okay. So that is what a timer module programming turns out to be. You will need to choose these three numbers. Clear? What is the clock speed or the what is the what is the count speed that you are going to deal with? How many counts need to elapse before something happens? What will happen when you reach that count? These three things you need to specify. And programming a timer module is only about learning how to specify these things. Clear? It is very, very simple actually in, in, uh, in principle and it just takes some practice for you to get used to it. So let's look at it without worrying too much about the detail that is there in this. So this bus clock is the clock information that is provided to you. Okay. There is an accumulator or a something which, which, which is used for counting. Don't worry about the term accumulator etc. right now. 
and a bunch of IO channels, either accept in input or give out in, give, give an output. That is all a timer module is. Okay. So, I uh, will just describe to you what you will end up uh, having to do. So, because a timer module has to deal with some information uh, which are put on some pins because you have to accept input from the external world and put outputs to an external world, you will need to decide whether those pins are going to accept input or give an output. Okay. So, you will have to say that this pin is going to become an input pin, this pin is going to become an output pin, etc. So, that choice is available to you. Okay. So, how do you specify this choice? It is through the setting of some numbers pertaining to some registers. Okay. So, I will just describe what a, what a register is. A register is a set of bits. Okay. How many of you do not know what a register is? Do not know what a register is? You know what a bit is? A collection of bits forms a register. Okay. Some information is contained in a register. The re reason why we are talking about collections of bits is because of the nature of how information is stored inside a microcontroller. So, you can you can have a 8 bit microcontroller, you can have a 16 bit microcontroller, usually that refers to the register sizes. Okay. So, what it turns out to be, so suppose you have to set a certain register to a certain value and if you set that register to that value, internally the hardware circuitry is just going to execute such that one pin is going to be an input pin, the other pin is going to be an output pin, output pin. So, programming a microcontroller or timer module of a microcontroller boils down to setting registers to suitable values. Okay, I will tell you what, what sort of registers you are going to deal with. So, for example, uh, you will see a section called register description in every module that you go into. So, the, today we are discussing the ti timer module right now, but if you go to the ATD module again you will see a set of registers that you will need to understand. Okay. The overall picture is should be clear to you. I need to be able to count, I need to be able to look at some clock and some scaled version of the clock and I, I need to be able to either take information or put out information. That is all the timer module is doing. Okay. So, the main counter register in this case is actually a 16 bit register. It is called this TCNTH. Can you see that? TCNTH and TCNTL. So, TCNT stands for timer counter. H stands for the high, high bits, L stands for the low bits. So, if you have a 16 bit register, you can count 65536 5, numbers. If you have a single bit register, how many numbers can you count? 0 and 1. If you have 2 bit register, you can count 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1. 4 numbers you can count. Okay. So, similarly, if you have 16 bits, you can count 65536 5, numbers, 65536 5, in decimal. Okay. So, many numbers you can count. So, what you will be able to do, right? if your count is 1 once every second, it will take 6. 65,536 seconds for that counter to go from 0, 0, 0, all zeros to 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, all ones. Okay? It is going to take that, that long for it to count all the way through. If your count frequency is much smaller than that, obviously it is going to take far lesser time for you to reach all the 1, 1, 1, 1, ones. Okay? So, the timer counter just has information, it just keeps counting. Okay. Every time it has to increment, it will increment. But what time it has to increment is decided by a scaled version of the clock. Okay. So, you will need to know how much to scale, uh, what the clock speed is and how much to scale the clock by. Because only that gives you the unit of time. This is only going to count. Every unit of time it increments by 1. Clear? So, the timer counter is a very important register. The TIOS, you will see a similar register tomorrow. Okay, I am going to leave it to you to find out what, what the TIOS register is. There are two registers required for scaling of the clock. Okay. So, uh, so I will just describe a few registers that you will have to use tomorrow. The first register you will have to use is to decide whether a, a pin is you going to be used for taking input or giving an output. Okay, the TIOS register the name may be slightly different 
depending on the microcontroller you, you are utilizing. For you, it will be the same tomorrow. The TIOS register allows you to choose that. Okay, so that is an important register for you to uh, for you to know about. The other uh, important register, of course, is the uh, timer counter that I have already described. So that is the TCNT. What else do you need to specify? Counter is done. What pin is is done? One is scaling that is left. What else do you need to be able to do? What to do when? When the timer counter reaches a particular value, you will have to do something. Okay? Is that clear? So what that value is? How do you specify that value? So that is done through a bunch of registers that are provided. Eight registers that are provided. Input capture, output compare registers, TCXH and TCXL. Okay, X stands for zero to seven. There are eight of these provided. Okay, these registers contain information about what number the it will keep comparing itself with the timer counter. When the timer counter keep uh, reaches a certain number, something will happen. Okay, so that information is also programmed by you. So TIOS, TCNT, TC, X. Okay, forget H and L for now. You are going to deal only with eight bit. Okay, these three are important important registers for you to deal with tomorrow. Okay, or equivalent of them. What else? Only one thing that is left: scaling, scaling of the bus clock. Okay, so how? So the bus clock is made available. You can't go faster than that. That is the unit of time cannot be faster than the bus clock. It will have to be something that is a scaled version. You can scale it down. Okay. So I will leave it to you how to scale it down because you will have to use that for the one second, uh, one second problem. Okay. Your bus clock will be running in megahertz. So I am just pointing out the issue. Bus clock will be running in megahertz. Your timer counter will will be eight bit or sixteen bit. Let us say it is eight bit. Then you are you are in more trouble. So, if you have only 256 numbers and you are running in megahertz, you will overcome those numbers, or you will go from zero to one 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 very quickly. Okay, it you don't even take take you a millisecond. So, you will need to keep track of how many of these overflows have happened. You understand? It goes from zero 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 to one 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 one, and again it comes back to zero zero zero. It keeps counting that way. Okay, so if you have to count large amounts of time with very small uh, clock periods, then you will have to keep track of overflows. That is what the, the challenge is for for the one second part of it. Okay, if you have to keep track only of small small amounts of time, that you will do through uh, through just looking at the TCNT and before it gets from zero 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 etc to one 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 at some point. You will just say, okay, if if it reaches this value, do do this thing. Okay. So tomorrow you will specify, or you will make a choice for what the numbers need to be corresponding to each of these registers. Okay. That involves only looking at the data sheet and writing the numbers down. TIOS equal to some eight bit value. Just put the bits information: zero, one, 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 zero, one, etc. If it is this, then I have chosen this to be an input, that to be an output, this to be an input, etc. Timer counter, of course, you don't have to do anything about it. You have to re read it. The TC, uh, the TC registers are the compare registers. So if you set, let's say you have an eight-bit timer counter. So let's do that exercise. Okay. So this guy is going from zero, 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 all the way to One one, one one. Okay, then again comes back to zero 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 and one one. It keeps doing that, just counting. If your TC zero is set to be one zero one zero, I'm just giving some random example. What happens is that when the timer counter reaches this value, one zero one zero one zero one zero, something will happen. What will happen is decided by you whether you will accept an input or give an output. 
that is where the TIOS part of it comes in. Is that clear? Any questions about this? This is not, this should not be too difficult. Okay. It's a very straightforward, straightforward thing. So, you are going to count 1 millisecond. So, what you have to do, the pro program is very simple. If you are in state 0, you have to toggle it to state 1. If you are in state 1, you have to toggle to state 0. Okay. So, if you are putting an output of 0, equivalent of that is 0 volt will come out in your in your oscilloscope, then you will have to output a, a 5 volt at the time half a millisecond is reached. Then if you are at state 1, again you go back to state 0 at the time half millisecond is reached. Very simple program, that is what you have to you have to construct. Okay? So, what you will end up doing is you will say TIOS is equal to some 8 bit number. So, I am just going to call it. Uh, something like this. This will imply that some pins are in for input, some pins are for output. TC0, one of the counters, one of the things that are used for comparisons may be something like this. Okay. Often times what happens is that you bunch these two things and express this as an hexadecimal number. What is the hexadecimal version of this? this is A. Hmm? So, this becomes A. So, you say that T C 0 is 0 x A A, 0 x standing for hexadecimal. Okay? So, what you will do in your program is make such statements. That is all you are doing. I will now tell you how a typical program looks like. Okay, what these statements are going to be to is something for you to figure out tomorrow by looking at the data sheet. Okay. So, what you are going to be provided with is a cross compiler interface, not the same interface that you are seeing here. So, you are going to be provided with a special program called a compiler. You know what a compiler is. How many of you know what a compiler is? What is it supposed to do? Accept your instructions and generate stuff that is closer, closer to what the machine will understand. Okay, so, it is a special program which, which translates what you write into closer to what the machine will understand. Okay. So, an interface will be provided, a GUI something like this will be provided to you and on the right hand side you see a, the, a typical micro, this program does nothing. Okay. It just keeps running. Okay. What you will have to do is get into this, let us say this loop and make statements like TIOS equal to 0 x f f, something like that. You have to make these series of statements. Okay. Who, how does this thing know that TIOS corresponds to that, that register? That information is also contained usually in a, in a dot h file. Okay. In this case, internally information is provided as to what this symbol TC0 stands for. Okay, the compiler does not, if, if you do not tell the, uh, tell, tell the compiler a priori that TC0, that symbol TC0 that you write there corresponds to setting or corresponds to the register, that hardware register, then it will not know that you are actually talking about that register. Okay, so, that information is usually contained in a dot h file which needs to be included. Okay, and uh, you will be you will be given a template program, so something that compiles, so that you don't start fiddling fiddling around with something that does not compile. What what you will do is just make statements. T C zero is equal to so much. T I O so T I O S equal to so much. T I E, which is the enable register, equal to so much, etc. That's what you will end up doing. Okay. What you will have to produce is signals of this form very simple. On your oscilloscope, you have to demonstrate this on your oscilloscope. Okay. The other thing you will be 
doing is utilizing ports. So, you will be writing numbers to some input output ports through which you will make some LEDs blink. Okay. What sort of numbers to write? What ports to write to? Again, the procedure remains the same. Go to the data sheet, look for the resource which corresponds to the port that you want to ut utilize. Ask yourself the question, what do I need to know? What do I need to be able to do? If, if somebody pro were to program me, what do I need to be able to do to make some numbers go out somewhere? The answer to the question will tell you what registers you need to set overall. Then go to the module registers, understand the registers, utilize uh, or set those values of registers in the program. This is the procedure for all of microcontroller programming. Okay. So, I just wanted to give you a brief sense for this. Programming does not, you, you cannot sit, sit back and you know read a book and learn programming. It does not work like that. The only way to learn programming is act, actually program. So, this sort of a, of an interaction is to tell you what is it that overall you are doing. Okay. The details of that you will, you will obviously get familiar with in your class. So, this, this time you will just get exposed to microcontrollers. Next time you will write something a little more sophisticated, but next time you will also be dealing with real data. You remember the RC filtering sort of experiment? Next time you will try to do filtering, but with uh, programming. Okay, you will take data, do an ATD, then uh, get it into a microcontroller, do some filtering there, get it out of a D2A. Okay, so, you will you will end up doing this whole thing. Any broad questions? If there are no broad questions, how many of you have no clue of what has been discussed so far? You are still raising your hand. Okay, good. Who else? Okay, so what I will do uh, is that your RAs and TAs will help in putting together the, uh, the manual as well as the uh, sheet that you need to read up before the or when you come for the experiments. I will also put resources pertaining to the microcontroller that you will be using on a consistent basis. Okay, what you will be uh, your data sheet, what you need to be looking at, which registers are important. I can give you th those sort of pointers. After that, it's up to you for you to take take forward and move on. Okay, all right.